Um, I'd like to do this introduction in three parts. Um, one is to read the information about tonight's speaker. He was born in 1928 in Troy, New York. He was the son of a general practitioner. He went to Union College, Albany Medical School, and Yale, the Department of Surgery, where he practiced and taught surgery for 25 years at the Yale Hospital. He retired in 1985. He began writing at the age four, at age 40. Uh, his works include books that are named Rituals of Surgery, Mortal Lessons, Confessions of a Knife, Letters to a Young Doctor, Taking the World in for Repairs. Uh, to be published, Volume 1 of a Diary, entitled A Mile and a, and a Half of Ink. He has also written numerous short stories, uh, starts short stories, essays, memoirs, and dozens of magazines. And for those of you that read the New York Times Sunday Book Review, will also find on occasion reviews by Dr. Richard Seltzer. He was in the Army in Korea and Japan between 1955 and 57. He has six honorary degrees, various literary prizes, Guggenheim Rockefeller Fellowships. That's what it says on the paper. Um, I came, of course, the question comes up, why is he lecturing at an architecture school? I heard of him through John Haydock years ago. John Haydock is, of course, the dean of the architecture school at Cooper Union. John Haydock has a propensity of simply saying, he's ri written the following books, go home and read them. I did. I then... Uh, when I was teaching um, at Yale in 1984, I asked him, I made sure that I made his acquaintance and invited him to participate on the jury of my problem that I gave at the school at that time, which has since found its way into an article in VIA, the architectural magazine of the University of Pennsylvania. He uh, is also in the process of preparing an article for Perspective, the Yale Architecture Magazine. In other words, he has become a kind of architectural cult figure. Um, but the real thing, and the third part of what I wanted to say was, these lecture series have, as you have noticed, over the past two plus years, have more than now and again been devoted to people outside, directly outside of the field and the discipline of architecture. And of course, tonight's speaker is one of those people. Um, this is a time in architecture which is marked by a confrontational posture which people like me have helped, for better and worse, to enliven. A debate that polarizes positions of the making of things, the uh, uh, for better or, and or worse, all of the movements in architecture up to recent times uh, over and against a position, polar from the first, which is rooted, let us say, in the work of post-structural theorists, literary criticism, critical theory, in a word, deconstruction. Now, the first attitude um, does not allow for the second, and the second doesn't allow for the first. There is, however, in a field such as medicine, something which can be called restorative. There is a restoration engaged and involved by people practicing medicine. One expects it. I would submit that that restorative quality will find its way at a point in time in architecture and it is no coincidence that it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Seltzer. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is an absolute scandal that you have invited a surgeon to come to a school of architecture. Uh, but I thank you anyway. I'm delighted to be here. This uh, lecture is supposed to be about the hospital, and so it will be, but it will also be about just about everything else as well. 
I'm going to begin if I can get some light. Sorry. I'm going to begin by uh, showing you a little bit about uh, uh, how a surgeon um, would, would feel uh, in one of these buildings that you will have one day made or have already made uh, called a hospital. And we will start uh, at the uh, core uh, of, of the building, which is the body of a patient. One purpose of an essay is to unite the outside world, all its objects and events, with the intimate dreams of the reader. For a surgeon, the abdomen is a chest or casket, a box that can be opened. The moment the abdomen is opened, the outside is effaced with a single stroke. An atmosphere of novelty and surprise reigns. The outside has no meaning. For this casket is full of jewels of unimagined splendor, inestimable worth. It is the writing surgeon's work to inventory this treasure, and more, to lead the reader into the interior so that he too can experience this mysterious place of his secret dreams. I feel some hesitation to invite you to come with me into the body. It seems a reckless, defiant act. Yet there is more than dread reflected from these rosy coasts, these restless estuaries of pearl, and it is time to share it. So shall I make of my fingers words, of my scalpel a sentence, of the body of my patient a story. One enters the body in surgery as in love, as though one were an exile returning at last to his hearth, daring uncharted darkness in order to reach home. Turn sideways, if you will, and slip with me into the cleft I have made. Do not fear the yellow meadows of fat, the red that sweats and trickles where you step. Here, give me your hand. Lower between the beefy cliffs. Now rest a bit upon the peritoneum. All at once, gleaming, the membrane parts, and you are in. It is the stillest place that ever was as though suddenly you are struck deaf. Why, when the blood sluices, fierce as Niagara, when the brain Third teems with Sunday electricity book and the numberless cells exchange their goods in ceaseless commerce, why is it so quiet? Has some priest in charge of these rites uttered the command, silence? This is no silence of the vacant stratosphere but the awful quiet of ruins, of rainbows, full of expectation and holy dread. Touch the great artery, feel it bound like a deer, and know the thunderless boil of the blood. Lean for a bit against this bone. It is the only memento you will leave to the earth. Its tacitness is everlasting. In the hush of the tissue, wait with me for the shaft of pronouncement. Press your ear against this body the way you did as a child holding a seashell and heard faintly the half-remembered, longed-for sea. Now strain to listen past the silence. In the canals, cilia paddle quiet as an Iroquois canoe. Somewhere nearby, a white whipslide of tendon bows across a joint. Fire burns here, but does not crackle. Again, listen. Now there is sound. Small splashings. 
tunneled currents of so air, find on occasion review. slow gaseous bubbles ascend through dark, unlit lakes. Across the diaphragm and into the chest, here it is all noise, the whisper of the lungs, the lubbed up, lubbed up of the garrulous heart. Once he has been led back out and the abdomen has been closed, the reader will go on dreaming of that place, the things he saw inside, and with even greater power, because his imagination has been set in motion. There will always be more things in a closed box than in an open one. To verify images kills them. It is always more enriching to imagine than to experience. A hospital. My earliest recollections of a hospital were of St. Mary's in Troy, New York. The year was 1932. My father, as you have heard, was a GP there during the Great Depression, the other depression. And the whole town was stone-sucking poor, as Lyndon Johnson might have put it. St. Mary's was a two-story red brick building built in the 1890s. It was situated halfway up the slope of a steep hill from which you could look down over the town to the Hudson River below. Ever since, I have always thought halfway up a hillside is just where a hospital belongs rather than at the summit, where a castle or a temple might be placed, having neither the opulence of a castle nor the otherworldly holiness of a temple. The hospital must be placed so as to be in touch with both the sacred and the profane. St. Mary's was a long rectangle with two pavilions or wings extending from either side since it was operated and staffed by an order of nuns called Sisters of Mercy, that building was winged in more ways than one. Now and then, Father would take me along when he went to make his rounds, and every single time I was enraptured. I can still close my eyes and smell that blend of starch, candle wax, ashes, and roses that permeated that building. It is an odor that I have not since discovered in any of a lifetime of hospitals since. It was the odor of sanctity, I think. The nuns ran the place as though it were the flagship of a fleet of warships on the eve of a naval battle, that is to say, with military precision. Here, if nowhere else, cleanliness was next to godliness. The polished floors wore a perpetual fanatic gleam. Dirt was rooted out as though it were sin. If my years be Methuselah, I shall never forget Sister Michael's evening inspection of the long marble corridor. Behind her limped the lame and wretched porter who had spent the entire day washing and waxing it. I remember the stiff white wings of her coronet slicing the gloom, the crusader's curve of her nostrils. Her eyes that reconnoitered every corner then turned upon the miscreant with the glare of black olives as she pointed to a bit of smudge that was invisible to me. But then in the matter of housekeeping, I wouldn't recognize dirt if I fell over it. I remember how the nun of wrath pointed one bony finger at the spot for the poor devil to see, how he stood there with the good-for-nothing look of a dog who has just made a mess on the carpet. The habit of the Sisters of Mercy was black, full, and fell to an inch and a half of the floor. From a cord about the waist, a black rosary hung. The wimple 
was topped by a starched white cornet with broad lateral flaps on either side of the head. One alone was a sailboat. Two, side by side, a regatta. Three, a whole armada. These sisters did not walk, they skimmed, they hovered. Free of the drag of gravity by which the rest of us are rooted to the earth, they floated quickly and noiselessly, save for the soft Between 1955 click of and wooden rosary beads tossing among the folds of their habits. With each step, the black nose of a shoe would peek from beneath the hem, then dart back inside the voluminous, flaring recesses, as though each of them were sheltering a family of mice. More than once in the springtime, I sat in the many-windowed solarium that was filled with vases of lilacs or peonies and gazed down the long hall in full expectation that the very next person I would see coming toward me would be the Virgin Mary herself, to whom I would, oh yes, I would, hold out my own wounded heart. Now and then I was permitted to go on the wards with Father, where I was made to sit at sister's desk, given drawing paper and crayons, and told to make a picture while sister and father went from bed to bed. There was no such thing as a private room, but the beds were lined up along the walls. In time of need, a movable cur curtain screen could be placed so as to conceal the newly dead, or afford at least the implication of privacy, if not real privacy itself. The people of St. Mary's knew that dignity was more important than privacy. Privacy can be dispensed with, without shame. Nobody can take away your dignity. To this day, I am of the opinion that private rooms in a hospital are a wrong-headed idea. Once encaged in a private room, the patient is out of sight as well as alone. This cannot be as safe or as functional as a great ward with 15 beds lined up on either side over which one sharp-eyed nurse could keep constant surveillance. To say nothing of the lovely sharing of misery that prevails in a ward, the hustle bustle that is the antidote to the boredom of the bedridden, what architects and doctors have lost sight of is the pleasure the sick take in just plain gossiping. It is on a ward, not in a private room, where the craving for gossip is likely to be satisfied. Besides, unless the gift of prophecy has deserted me, a ward is not one inch farther from heaven than a private room. When the time comes for me to be put in a hospital, let it be in a ward where my sighs and groans can mingle with the sighs and groans of my fellow human beings in the consolation of fraternity. 35 years later, my own children were to find themselves similarly ensconced at a nurse's station, waiting for me to hurry up and finish making rounds so they could show me the pictures they had oh. drawn. As severe as Sister Michael was with that porter, just so kindly did she move among the sick. Mercy, just before leaving the world of medicine forever, lingered a while among those sisters. How different from those nuns were the doctors who stepped importantly among the puddles of patients, especially the surgeons who were quite convinced that having left the ward, their disembodied radiance lingered on. Of all the attending physicians, father was the sister's favorite, and he adored them in return. Their mutual affection was based on his gallantry and good-humored teasing, to which they responded with a rolling up of the eyes and a commotion of cornets. From father, I inherited a foolish sort of gallantry of my own, which once upon a time had to do with women. 
but which nowadays manifests itself as an insistence upon overtaxing my 60-year-old carcass in arduous hikes or swims. From father also, my admiration for the piety of others. Temperamentally unable to surrender to faith, I remain to this day in a condition, condition of, of awe at the faith of others. It is what constitutes for me a belief in God only once removed like a cousin. When I was 12, father lay dying at St. Mary's Hospital long before my eyes had had their fill of him. I remember the vigilant nuns grouped like lamps in the darkened room, his face graying away, theirs aglow with an imperturbable golden light. Time was when admission to a hospital was tantamount to a sentence of death. Even the jailhouse was preferable as it did not imply physical suffering and there was always the possibility that you would be let out. Only the morgue with its grim air of finality was more to be dreaded. The fact is that there wasn't too much that could be done for you. It was the therapy of subtraction. Something was taken away from you after you'd had the odd amputation, a series of animas and cathartics, and as much bleeding as necessary to feed the resident vampire. You'd have had everything they had to offer but the priest. And then there he was, with an ecclesiastical smile permanently etched on his face, exhorting you to face up to it. The best that could be said of it was that your suffering would not be prolonged. It says on the paper. You would not be salvaged from one agony after another, only to be permitted to go to your eternal reward after half a dozen close calls. Those were the good old days, when a single martyrdom was enough. Under present conditions, the hospitalized sinner, no matter how unrepentant, is apt to endure enough suffering to die out of debt. Nor does it reassure one today that these premises are called such things as Mercy Hospital, Memorial Hospital, Misericordia Hospital, or even Martyr's Hospital. <laughs> Martyr's Hospital at least has a certain unvarnished candor. Were I placed in charge of naming the hospitals of this country, I would call a moratorium on the letter M. <laughs> it's a dirgy sort of letter, if there ever was one. Who would not rather go into the strong comeback hospital rather than the strong memorial hospital? Or the Massachusetts Palace of Healing? I want to now read you a little piece about a room in a hospital. Kind of give you the feel of what it's all about. Let me preface this uh, little piece that I'm going to read to you. It's called Semi-Private Female. That's a category of uh, uh, accommodation at the hospital, which means it is not a private room. It's for women, and uh, usually from four to six uh, uh, women rather than 15 or 20 occupy. So it's called semi-private, comma, female. Uh, as I read it, you will see how by personifying inanimate objects, a curtain, a wall, a hot I towel. Came, of course the question By giving these objects the power of expression, I have tried to give the room a sensory immediacy uh, that will reveal uh, the full scope 
of what is taking place in it. The mop, walls, curtains, and so forth constitute a kind of commenting chorus. By the precise application of images, the room itself will be depicted if I have succeeded. Far more graphically than were I merely to describe the objects in it. Okay. Semi-private female. Room 324 is at the end of the corridor. Of course, the it has four beds, one. each separated from the others by a curtain, which can be drawn to achieve that status listed in the admissions office as semi-private. In this room at this time, it is less the presence of the curtains between the beds than the shrouded minds of the women that secure for each her territory. In any case, they lie hidden from each other. Only their dreams cannot be kept separate. These issue forth in sallies from the beds to mingle aloft. Opposite the door is a bank of windows covered by slatted blinds. The roses are cruel that line the ledge in front. From the outside ledge comes the low, watery trill of roosting pigeons. The nurse in charge of this ward will strive by her presence to bind the patients together. She cannot bear their isolation. All day she will use her strong body, stepping from one bed to the other, spinning threads of cheerful talk. Her hands will touch them each in turn. Her voice urge them into a community, coax. But in the end, neither she nor they will be persuaded. All night, the women have fed the sick moisture with their lungs. The curtains belly and collapse with each breath. Palpable wisps are a gauntlet through which the nurse must pass. She sets her bowed head against the air and barges in, then goes quickly to raise the blinds. The windows are flung open, discharging the pigeons Is and bringing into focus the litter of the night. This nurse depends upon the magic of air and sunlight. For a long moment, she stands in the center of the room and sighs for her task. Somehow she must scour it clean, make of the dark, infectious squalor a neat, thatched cottage. But even then, she knows that in spite of everything, it would remain a, a stumpy hovel. She could hope only for the simple dignity of shiny floors and plumped pillows. The hush of the night is still present, made even more hushed by the noises that come from the beds, as though small deer are stamping among dry leaves. It cannot be done, the nurse thinks, although God knows she has hummed hymns often enough as she mopped and swabbed and polished. Precisely because she has tended and pitied, the desolation is hers as well. Soon she is joined by another woman, a nurse's aide. They smile and draw resolve from each other's bosoms and arms. The nurse's aide steps to one bedside and gently shakes a vanished shoulder. Wake up, dear, she calls into the heap of cinders and other hard particulars. Time to get up. How do you feel today? A purse string is tugged, and a dusty mouth that had hung open all night is slowly gathered in. How do you feel this morning? The woman in the bed stirs. A pair of gulls is pulling at the carcass of sleep. At last, she speaks. How do I feel? Dead. And it ain't half bad. So go away and let me be. We'll have a nice bath. Don't you want a bath? And the two nurses begin with pans of water. Together they soap armpits and legs, taking some pleasure themselves in the warm lather, then wiping dry with towels. No crease so hidden, no bag of skin so empty that they will not bathe and powder and cream. They turn the woman from side to side to extricate wet yellow sheets and lay new resentful ones, pulling them tight old dry hair that at any given cough might be dislodged from her head is brushed and braided. All the while the hungry bed curtain reaches for the backs of the nurses, mad for attention. 
The nurses move quickly now, emptying pans, bringing fresh water, crooning. Their uniforms stir up the smells of alcohol, tincture of benzoine, oil of cloves, sincerer smells than the cajolery of the flowers on the ledge. At last, creamed and oiled with rich vowels, the woman settles back in the bed, sighs, I... and takes root. Give us a chance, ladies, they call out to the other drawn curtains. You'll get yours soon enough. But now the doctor has arrived. It is like a rock falling into moist earth. He is a big man, a surgeon after all, with a clumsy face rescued by pale green eyes and by a mahogany voice, which any number of nurses have said is a powerful therapy in itself. But no more. The green eyes have long since been weakened, made more permeable by the sights they have seen. He's lost an entire dimension. He has forgotten himself. Now he listens to presences. On rounds, the imperious placement of his feet has softened into a kind of lumbering. In his youth, he had played football. Still, at the first sound of his footsteps, the room trembles, then recovers itself. Again and again, the doctor has tried to cast his net about the secrets of this room, but he cannot. There are times when he is in a tomb, ministering to phantoms. Perhaps if he were to make a diagram of this room, everything drawn to scale, if he were to count and measure every object, Perhaps he would come upon the one piece that did not fit, a blunder in the design. He would study this mistake until it revealed the mystery of this place. Then it would be given to him to know. He envies the nurses to whom the patients will offer fragments of their lives, small illuminations from which by his gender or his position, whatever, he is excluded. He must divine. It is never so reliable as revelation. Once while standing at the bedside of someone who had just slipped into coma, he had an urge to bend close to that face, which was like a blank sheet of paper, and tell his own secrets, which he knew would be safe there and nowhere else. But he had not uttered a word to that muteness where sleep and waking take no turn, where nothing is born and nothing dies. The bed is still empty where she had lain for months, blind and bandaged like an ear of unshucked corn. Coma. Who can elect it? Who renounce? The patient in the next bed is an emaciated woman, a Filipino, in the sixth month of a pregnancy. There is a frost of ashes about her mouth. Each night she is swept clean by a fever that has burnt up every bit that is not essential. Blood, saliva, tears, tissue. Only the mighty fetus, raving to be born, is not touched. Even as the child buds and splits and specializes, the woman grows daily less differentiated until she is something rudimentary, a finger of flesh, unfulfilled, unformed that will surely die of its one achievement. She resembles a snake that has swallowed a rabbit and is exhausted by her digestion. Through the translucent, dark-veined belly, the legs of her meal moving. She has had no visitors, the nurse informs. One morning, the sun was sparking the blinds. A breeze from the open window blew aside the smoky curtain around the Filipino woman's bed. And he had a glimpse of her lying with her robe half apart and the flickering, radiant abdomen, swollen like dough under a damp cloth. Waves of heat rose from it. He was shocked to find her so young, a child, really, with eyebrows as thin and arched as a moth and tiny inquisitive fingers probing her pouting navel. On that morning, behind the untrustworthy curtain, alone save for the ghost of pleasure she was bearing, she had been smiling. The last of it was still upon her inconsolable mouth. 
He had an impulse to step through the curtains and examine her body for the imprint of a hand, teeth marks, some proof that once a man had bent there to kindle a fire and warm himself. The doctor removes his white coat and rolls up his sleeves to change the dressing of the colostomy he has made in the last woman's abdomen. Her hands, trying to keep out of the way, become hopelessly lost. Not so long ago, in the orange groves of Florida, she had loved a man with all her heart. From the day he had left her without a single word, she never dared to utter his name. In a few weeks, it will shrink down to a rosebud, the doctor tells her. You will only have to wear a little bag. What, she asks him and waits. She has the petaled look of something in a vase. Cancer, he says. The word blisters his lips. He does not approve of lying to patients to encourage them falsely. But it is possible, as every gardener knows, to fool flowers into blooming by keeping a light on all night. In the leaden bafflement that follows, he is aware of his own naked forearms, the black hair on his wrists, the ropey veins. There had been trouble drawing her blood for the laboratory. She had been stuck so many times. The veins were broken, thrombosed. He himself had tried without success. Open and close your fist, he had told her. That's it, pump up a good one. Her fingers bunched, but it was very far from a fist. Nor were her veins to be seen or felt shy little lizard's tails that sensed the needle drawing near and laid themselves flat among the hummocks of fat. He wished he could have lent her one of his own. It was as close as he had ever dared come to taking upon himself the pain of someone else. At last the woman's lips part and the tip of her tongue surfaces. Her mouth is crammed with words that she does not know how to speak. What is the cause of it? Why did it happen? It is one of those things, he tells her. Mistakes like copper bands tighten around the doctor's temples. What kind of honest work leaves scabs on someone else's knuckles at the end of the day? John Hiddick is a... How he hated this room, the dubious promise of the place, the duplicity of it, toying with the hopeful, singling out the weaknesses of the downcast until their hearts were broken. The solarium is at the opposite end of the corridor. It is another sorrow of a room. Here the doctor watches as a man wearing a brow of thorns waters the artificial plants with real tears. He is that woman's husband. His name is Tom. From then on, the woman never stops. To and fro, her flesh swims in quarter circles, paddling for all she is worth to reach a shore, but sinking deeper and deeper. Now and then she will rise to the surface, take a few swallows of air, squawk, then down again to whatever murk. On her last day, at that red hour of evening, when grace, if it will come at all, is most likely to make an appearance, the doctor returns to her bedside. The thorned man, Tom, is there, holding the curtains away with his broad back to keep them from reaching for whatever is left still quivering upon the bed. A pot of yellow tulips sits on the nightstand and voices assurance that nothing bad is taking place. All at once, the woman pauses in her work, turns her head as though to listen. A breach of clarity opens, and with it, immense pain. Her eyes are crystals of it. Eddie, Eddie, she cries out, for God's sake, Eddie. But the husband's name is Tom. Shh, shh, he says, I'm here. Eddie, oh love, she calls out again. She is running wildly through streets of confusion, thinking to tag a footstep, making a last run for it. Yes, says the man simply, it's all right. I've come. 
I'm here, and takes her hand, but the hand will not be deceived, and flicks away an imaginary insect, so that the man Tom knows that she has kept a secret. He wrenches his gaze to a distant place somewhere above the bed, looking after something slippery that he had once held but that had suddenly spurted from his hands. A young boy, too, leans against the curtains. Dazzled, that boy cannot pry his gaze from his mother's face, nor ever would he be rid of it. Years later, in those deep breaths, one after the other, rolling in, rolling out like the sea, in the deepest of them, he would locate his own most painful memory. Much later, the doctor hurries up the steps to his house. He turns the key in the lock, opening the door only wide enough to let himself in. But it is no use. Like an unwanted, homeless dog, the room follows him into the house, demanding that he step into it and do something. I was told not to come out here and shed a lot of gloom, which I think I have just done. Uh, and I'm now going to change the uh, pace just a little bit and finish by reading you a very short little piece. It's for architects only. It's brand new. And you are the first people in the whole world to hear it. Go home Take and it read what them. it is worth. It's not at all about hospitals. Not at all. I'm sick of hospitals. This piece is called Connecticut in Ruins. Just as a gourmet loves his cheese, the older and moldier the better, my taste in buildings is for ruins. A half-tumbled abbey, the fallen columns of a once great temple whose roof is whatever cloud is passing over it. These things never fail to stir me with their sad beauty. It should come as no surprise then that my favorite artist is Piranesi with his hundreds of vast ruined vaults and that lovely sense of ill-fatedness. And am I the only one who would feel relief were the leaning tower of Pisa to fall? <laughs> it wants to so badly. Let it go, I say, so that once it has been strewn upon the ground, we might step among the ancient crumble, our hearts full of pleasurable melancholy rather than the suspense one now feels. <laughs> in the presence of such a freak. Only the most godless architect would think of shoring up the poor thing and keeping it from its longed-for collapse. <laughs> but in Connecticut, my state, there are no ruins before which a citizen might stand and meditate upon the passage of ancient glory. The closest thing we've got to ruins are the thousands of stone walls of the simple pile one on top of the other variety built by the early settlers to demarcate their property or restrain their livestock. But each of these walls seems to me more a harsh sermon in stone than a bona fide ruin. You could hardly imagine the god Pan sitting cross hoofed on one of them playing his pipe. Having no precipices to speak of, like California, say, and no craggy mountains such as are owned by Wyoming, nor any wild torrents flinging themselves across our midsection, we are not, after all, Idaho, it behooves us to have some ruins to which the rest of the country might come and be as cheerfully mournful as it wishes, if for no other reason the relatively great age of our statehood demands it. 
It is regrettable that this absence of ruins in Connecticut is unlikely to be corrected in the near future. The very minute an old building shows the least sign of falling into rack, it is either raised and paved over for a parking lot, or worse, it is authentically restored <laughs> down to the last doorknob and then put right back into the use for which it was originally created. What cheek. <laughs> Just imagine checking in at the Temple of Asculapius to have your hernia repaired. <laughs> Frankly, I think the architects are missing the boat. Were I to practice architecture in this newfangled state, I would specialize in building ruins to order. A broken triumphal arch, a lone marble pillar with nearby a pagan I was altar teaching. slab, to suggest human sacrifice. <laughs> or a dark frown of a tower with the very best echo, hollow, dismal, and so distinct as to be taken by the susceptible for a resident spirit giving answer. Right in the middle of Hartford, I would build a stone labyrinth with drawings of bulls on the wall. A mazy sprawl of corridors into which the more daring would venture, perhaps never to be seen again. <laughs> and on the outskirts of Bridgeport, something barbaric, like Stonehenge. Surely there is a huge untapped market for that sort of thing. In addition to a resurgence of tourism, the state would be further benefited by the springing up of a whole new occupation, that of hermitry as each ruin must, by definition, have its own hermit living in a shed nearby. Someone emaciated, who looks well in goat skin and is good at glaring. And how amusing for the natives to watch busloads of Texans making off with the bits and pieces of rubble we have artfully strewn about. <laughs> for earnestly taking rubbings of the graffiti we have only yesterday carved into the gatepost. <laughs> From public ruination, I would branch out into the private sector and design for every homeowner a special garden. Situated at the rear of the house, this garden would be enclosed on three sides by high hedges, and on the fourth side, by an equally high stone wall to be used specifically for whaling. <laughs> Not only would this too be good for Connecticut, a whaling wall is what every family needs. I can think of nothing in the therapeutic armamentarium of medicine so beneficial as to press your forehead against a cool stone and just let go. <laughs> Certainly, the divorce and suicide rates would plummet. Perhaps even the entire field of psychiatry would become obsolete. I said that I would design, not build, these wailing walls, as I am of the firm opinion that the head of each household should build his own in order to foster the necessary intimacy between maker and construction. Still. In order to lay the proper emphasis and set the mood, I hereby offer uh, six instructions on how to build a wailing wall. One, at the outset, having prepared the mortar, stand for a moment beside the pile of stones you have collected. Pick up your tools one at a time, trowel, chisel, mallet, and invoke blessings upon them. Two, be at ease. Remember that even before the first stone has been placed, the whole wall exists within you, waiting to grow out of your arms. Bricks, by the way, are impermissible. There is no element of fatal selection uh, in the making of a brick wall. With bricks, it is just one damn brick after another. Three, dwell upon the source of your stones. 
From where have they been gathered, these gray sadnesses that you intend shall lie with each other for the next thousand years? Have you taken them from the slope of the mountain, where they had been imprinted by a million years of wind and rain? Do they come from the bed of a river and so have been carved by currents, shadowed by trout, and through countless winters lain brooding beneath ice? Four. Now begin. Pile stone upon stone. Apply mortar until what there is is a wall with naked hollows of sorrow and here and there a pocket of commiseration where in time moss and small ferns might cushion a penitent brow or soak up the tears of widow and exile alike. Each stone will have felt your animating breath made upon sure it that I made the grip of your hand. Offer up to this wall your strength and your exactitude. It must be made just so. Five. Notice that the higher the wall rises, the lighter the stones become. As the wall, eager for completion, welcomes each addition and shares in the labor. Lighter and lighter they will grow, more and more translucent, until the topmost stones are feathers that at any moment may group themselves into wings and fly up in celebration of what you have made. Six. Is it finished? The last stone raised and set. Now stand close. Lean your forehead against the wall. Wail and be consoled. People of Connecticut, let us build ruins and walls so that a thousand years from now, Connecticut will be known as the state of ruin, <laughs> the land of the wailing wall where any stranger who wanders within our borders will pause and say with gloomy delight, Connecticut was. Thank you very much.